Thanksgiving 2019. You know it's going to be hard. Ah, it's election season again. And you go home, you sit with your folks, your racist uncle comes over. Oh my God. And he starts in, but you have facts, you know, you've been at college and you have facts, right? And he starts to say America was a great country until the libs. And then you're like, wait a second though, uncle, because liberal isn't opposite conservative, actually. Progressive is opposite conservative and authoritarian is opposite liberal. And you used to say you were libertarian, but the stuff you're saying is really authoritarian. Let's talk about it. And he goes, ah, oh, whatever. That's just your education talking. That's your education talking. I have common sense. All right. Okay, dude. Uh, satellite in orbit. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's a low Earth orbiting satellite. It goes around the Earth every 96 minutes. It's starting to, starting to get a little drag. How should I start to, to, to how should I start to formulate the equations for the delta, delta V I'm gonna have to do to boost this sucker back up and keep it at that 96 minute period? Well, that takes education. Common sense is just not an appropriate tool for the world that we live in anymore, and Uncle Derek should just sit down. In my house, if I start a sentence with, that's your education talking, I follow it up with, and since you're an expert in the field with more standing than me, I'm going to shut up and listen for a second. So let's talk about common sense. Greetings. Welcome back to the Black Bill. I've already given you a brief intro to the idea that common sense can't lead us to certainty or even towards certainty or anywhere near certainty. And today I'm going to go a little bit over the top on the concept of common sense. Like in your philosophy of science education, we are probably barely even bringing up the concept and hardly touching on it if we do. But let's like do a reasonably robust deconstruction here. So we start with the Dunning-Kruger problem. And by now you should know about the Dunning-Kruger problem. We're talking about the U-shaped relationship between confidence and competence. The more competent somebody is, the more qualified they are to judge their performance. And so in the in the beginning, when you don't know anything about a field of study, it's very easy to feel very confident that you know everything about that field of study or that you're very skilled in the thing that we're trying to train you to perform. So two people in an argument or a debate. One person is, I don't know, let's say uh, Secretary of State, and they've spent years making high-level executive decisions about U.S. foreign policy. And the other is a reality TV troll who has no information or training or basis to answer any foreign policy questions. Now, the troll speaks at the fourth grade reading level. If you write down everything the troll says and run it through the software that assesses reading level, that's what you get. The expert knows they're talking to a generalized American audience and they try to dumb facts down to about the ninth grade reading level. In doing so, they lose their more educated audience and they fail to do it and they lose all of their less educated audience. And America just doesn't listen at even the ninth grade reading level. So people without education or experience just cannot tell the difference between those two arguments. Thus, the argument becomes aesthetic, and you go with your gut or name recognition or wh whatever was the last item you saw in the news. And the troll wins a debate. It happens in one form or another, time and time again in American politics. There is no common sense, just a series of logical errors. And the first of those logical errors is the inability to gauge just how little we know about anything that's very complicated. And so if you ever hear anyone saying it's just common sense or it's just very simple, you know that they're selling something and you should step away from them. Okay. So the next logical error is called false consensus and false consensus comes in two different flavors. Flavor one is everyone believes what I believe. This is a problem of egocentrism. Remember that little kids are terrible, terrible liars because they just lack any theory of mind and because they don't know anything, they can't begin to imagine what an adult mind would know. Okay. Good. 
So ultimately, this is an egocentric problem. We never really grow out of the egocentrism problem. We think that we're well-studied and full of knowledge and competent and capable. And ultimately, when we get anywhere outside of our fields of competence, we feel very confident because we just can't imagine um, other people knowing other things. And so we just tend to believe that other people think the same as us. They make their decisions on the same bases and they're looking at the same information and we're just not. The things that I believe, I don't believe them for the reason you probably believe the things that you believe. And I'm, I'm not even super comfortable with the word belief because it kind of puts us on an apparently even footing and I don't have any evidence that our footing is remotely even. Okay. The second version of false consensus is the idea that I can see everybody, that I would even know what other people think. And this is a variation of the availability heuristic, just a way of making snap decisions about big situations. But we live in super narrow social channels. Church, for example, is the most segregated day in America. If you're black and you go to church, you probably go to a black church. And if you're white and you go to church, you probably go to a white church. And you go to the mega church up north in my city, and it's 10,000 white people and like four black people. So you can go, yes, we're a diverse congregation. We're inviting to everybody. Actually look around. Actually spend some time looking around. And then we have our super individualized social media experience, where the more you click on articles from a certain news site, the more you get articles from that news site. And the more you click on stuff on a certain topic, the more you get stuff on that topic. And the more people politically disagree with you, the more that you block them from your social media. And so you never hear from them at all. We rarely come into contact with people who disagree with us anymore. And that's a strategy. Making the beliefs of one political party so ridiculous and hostile and outre and racist that's a strategy exactly to divide people off from their friends and family who might possibly have some chance of moving them out of their ridiculous beliefs, right? You're only surrounded anymore by people who share your ridiculous beliefs. And then try and remember those goofy motherfuckers who took over the bird sanctuary in Oregon. This was, oh, I don't know anymore, six or seven years ago maybe, and if you remember the story, you don't remember the bird sanctuary. You remember a federal building. The, 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 the Washington and Oregon militias, they got together and they took over a federal building in Oregon. Well, technically, it was a federal building, but not a federal building. It was a federal building because it's a bird sanctuary on a federally protected wildlife refuge. Um, but the news being what the news is, they reported it the other way as a federal building to get attention. It was just like 20 racist white power dudes, and uh, they thought they were initiating the white power revolution, that finally we were going to have a new constitutional convention and make black people illegal or whatever racist bullshit they were into, and it didn't go the way they expected. There was not like a massive white power uprising across the United States. How they got there was they were not on traditional social media. They weren't on Facebook or Twitter, or if they were, not that much. They were on message boards. And the only people allowed on their message boards were people who agreed with them. And there was a certain amount of self-selection there. Like uh, non-racist people just weren't that interested in their white power militia groups. And so they didn't sign up for them and they weren't on the message boards. So they asked everyone they knew, hey, if we start a revolution, are you in? If we start a white power revolution, are you going to join us on that? Are you going to send materiel and supplies and ammunition and soldiers? And everyone they knew said, yes, we're with you, brothers. White power. And um, they didn't ask me. I would have said, no, go fuck yourself. Did they ask you? Did they ask you if you wanted to be part of the white power revolution? Uh, obviously not. Obviously not. And so you can search the YouTube thing and you can find the videos of them opening packages and expecting to get supplies and field rations and ammo and stuff. And people sent them bags of gummy penises so they could literally eat a dick. And they sent them, um, they sent them packages of dildos 
sex toys so they could literally go fuck themselves. And you can watch them get just sort of hot and heated about that, and it's fun, and fuck white power militias, fuck fascists. Okay, so that's false consensus in two flavors, right? So common sense comes into play because you believe everything that you think is true and that everyone else agrees that it's true, and so you can just go around saying common sense. This is a kind of appeal to popularity in the end, and there's a future vid coming where we'll talk about appeals to popularity. Everyone believes a thing. It's a very popular belief. Everyone's doing it. Everyone's saying it. People are saying. Um, and just because a lot of people believe a thing doesn't make that thing true. So I used to, back in 19, when I went to college the first time, I had a political science professor who'd explain the appeal to popularity like this. Are two heads better than one? What if the two heads are Beavis and Butthead? So there's that. It's a kind of appeal to popularity. It's common sense. Everyone believes it. Everyone knows it. It's a common belief. Therefore, it's true. Uh, but just think for yourself about all the stuff that people believe that absolutely is false. Like, Adam ruins everything wouldn't be fun at all if people actually believed sensible, true things, right? Okay. And the last component of common sense is hindsight bias. In the end, appeals to common sense are usually really just a bludgeon that we use to abuse people who make mistakes that seem obvious in retrospect. So there was an earthquake in Italy like 10 or 11 years ago, and the seismologist didn't give stern enough, strenuous enough warnings and some people died in the earthquake because they didn't get out of their houses fast enough, and um, the government put them in prison. Put seismologists in prison. I'm here to tell you that seismology is nowhere near the level where you should be listening very strongly to seismologists telling you whether an earthquake is or is not going to happen. They can talk in some terms of general likelihood, like we think one's going to happen kind of soon, and kind of in this area, but this town needs to evacuate nowhere near that level of specificity, okay? So those guys do not belong in jail. And state houses, state congresses, and, state congresses and senates, they keep writing laws making it legal for homicide victims or their families or families of successful suicides to legally sue the perpetrator's psychology professional, your psychiatrist or your psychologist. You know, I'm your therapist, and I ask, are you feeling suicidal today? And you say no, and you go home and blow your head off. I'm liable for that. I'm liable for that under state law. The family can come back and sue me for that. And if we can't predict where an earthquake is going to happen, how much more complicated is an individual human being? The problem here is Dunning-Kruger again, the laity, just ordinary street people, have no concept whatsoever what a psychologist does for a living, or what they can know and how they can know it. They think we have magical mind-reading powers, and can and should be responsible for the behavior of our patients and clients. That's just insane. That's insane. Right? So common sense, we have to let it go as a way of knowing. Because a lot of people believe a thing, because you believe it and think I believe it, because you don't know anything about a given field of study, because you look around and you see a bunch of people who agree with you and know the words to your fight songs, it, none of that makes common sense a reliable way of knowing anything, and you just have to let it go.